morning. It is certainly a privilege and a blessing to look out and see so many people to come together to worship God and to seek the grace that he so freely offers to us and to know that we can walk, truly walk in it, in the light that he has set before us. We're so thankful that you're here with us this morning, especially if you're visiting with us. We want you to know that you're welcome and wanted right here at West Hill. If you're looking for a church home, if you're looking for a family to help you and to help get to heaven, then uh, look no further than West Hill. This is a congregation of loving, compassionate people, and if that's what you're looking for, we want you to help us uh, be the best that we can be in following God and Christ's example for us. I have just one announcement I, I would like to make mention of. The uh, mission trip that is coming up later this summer, uh, if you parents have looked at the packet, you know that your children uh, have some... Uh, things that they have to do, whether it's memorize a few scriptures or go visiting at different places or some art projects or something like that. Uh, and to help you out, uh, I think that the, the sheet actually says that you've got to go with a preacher or an elder. Uh, I go visiting on Tuesdays, and your child is welcome to come and assist me in going to make those visits on Tuesdays. Uh, this week I will also go on Thursday. Uh, and I say all of that, and then I, I do have to make one caveat. Uh, I have a prison visit on Tuesday morning this week, and so uh, we will have to do it later in the afternoon, probably around 3 o'clock or so on, on Tuesday after I get back from the prison. So, uh, but I still want to be able to uh, be available, so uh, I think we took a couple last week and did all the visits that they needed to do. We had to do I think they have to do three visits. Uh, it may take actually uh, you know, a couple of trips for us to usually get that done, but, but last week we were able to get several of them done at one time and so, uh, uh, or in one day. So uh, if, if you were looking to do that, as, especially you, you guys, you, you teens that are looking to get that visiting done, uh, you're welcome to come with me. And, of course, uh, you can always uh, talk to one of the elders, and I'm sure on the visits that they make they would uh, appreciate you coming along with them as well. Uh, and Corey or Tim will also make visits, and so if you would rather go with one of them, uh, you can speak with them about that. But I just wanted to let you know, Tuesdays are the day that I normally go, and so if you have a free Tuesday and would like to uh, uh, mark that, that particular task off your list, uh, then I uh, would love to have you come along. Uh, like many little boys growing up, I thought that I needed to be tough. And the best way to be tough was to use tough language or rough language. Words that uh, Mama always taught me not to say. Don't say those words. And when I would say them, I would get in trouble. And so I didn't say them around my Mama. But you know, when I obeyed the gospel, as Paul said, we put away childish things. And I knew that meant that I had to put away the, the bad language that, that I had grown accustomed to. Uh, I knew that in order to be a Christian, I had to let my language be seasoned with salt instead of seasoned with the dirt that had been coming from my mouth. And so the first couple of months, I, I, I was very diligent, and I worked extremely hard to, to make sure that I, I, I didn't say those words. And, and it really, it, it, was, it was amazing that after three, four, five months, I, I was doing very well. And, and you know how it is in your Christian life. When you're doing really good, that's when the devil jumps in. And it says in, in Galatians 6, 1, overtaken in a sin. And in this particular instance, it was, uh, it was Friday night football, and Caddo was playing against uh, a, a, a team called Ringling from Ringling, Oklahoma. This is 1988. And uh, I remember we were, we were playing them very well. Ringling was heavily favored. We were at the bottom of the district. They were at the top of the district. We went into halftime 7-6, and Caddo was ahead. And so, you know, there was this, this, this euphoria. We, we could actually win this game. We're up by a point. This could be it. And I remember when they ran a sweep around the far end and they went over 70 yards for a touchdown. I can remember turning and it is like watching television today. And, and I can still see that, that blue and white uniform running down the sideline. And when they scored, I said a word that I will never forget. It was the first time I'd uttered any word like that in months. But in that moment, in, in the anger of that moment, I said that word. And I remember what I did as soon as I said it. I prayed to God to forgive me. 
while I was crying. I wasn't crying because they went up 12-7, won the game at 12-7. I was crying because I had failed my Creator. Because I had failed my God. I had failed my Savior. And I remember the, the guilt and the shame that I felt in that moment. Even as the other team was celebrating, I was, I was weeping over my state before God. My understanding of faith and fellowship and Christianity at that time was, was very immature. I, I was under the impression and believed that, that sin, every sin that I committed, broke fellowship with God until I repented of that sin and I asked God for forgiveness. To me, Christian living was a series of spiritual hiccups where, where I would live close to God and in the light of God for a while and then, and then I would hiccup in sin. And in that moment, maybe a bad word, maybe an impure thought or an outburst of anger, I would, I would interrupt my fellowship with God. I would step out of the light. Then I would step back into the light. And then I would step out of the light. And if I forgot to repent of a sin, maybe I, I sinned something in the morning and, and, and really didn't think about it at that time, then later in the day thought about it and had forgotten to repent of it. So I, was, I felt like those hours that I didn't repent, I was lost. I jeopardized my soul in those few hours. There was apprehension about my salvation at any given moment. I just didn't feel saved, assured of my salvation. I knew that once saved, always saved, as a, as a denominational doctrine was false. Therefore, my simplistic view of sin, any sin, was, uh, since it were not once saved, always saved, every sin must, must jeopardize my relationship with God. My understanding was as simplistic as it could be. But as I matured in the Bible, as I began to read more, as I, I realized that Christianity isn't a start and stop journey. And John really reveals this in 1 John. If you have your Bibles, turn uh, to 1 John 1. As we look at walking in the light, uh, you know, our, our concluding lesson in this series, we've been, we've been talking about this for a month now, but the concluding lesson in walking the light, and I assure you we could keep going on, on many other different things, but I want to examine the fellowship and the sanctification that we have by walking in the light. Um, that's, that's essentially what we want in, in this world, is that the blessings or the results of walking in the light uh, we have already in this series, we looked at, for example, walking in sin. Corey was looking at how sin interrupts our, uh, or, or uh, jeopardizes our souls. Uh, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the, the way of death, Proverbs 12, 14 and 12. We've looked at how we get out of that life of sin, that lost condition, and into the light of Christ the true light, as we would call it, getting into Christ. Last week, Corey uh, took us through the idea of what it means to walk in the light. And he did a great job, fantastic job, about showing how walking the light doesn't mean not sinning, but rather it means walking openly and transparent before God about our sin, that we do sin and we own up to it. And that sets us up then for uh, the result of walking in the light, fellowship and sanctification, the two blessings that John spells out for us. Uh, let's begin, though, looking at 1 John 1 and verse 7, and, and we're going to look at the condition. What is the condition or the conditions that John sets forth for the blessing? The word if begins here, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. That's the promise. But here's the condition. If we walk, the word if states conditions that must be met in order for a certain action or reaction to occur. For example, we might say, if the power goes out, the lights will go off. If then, if the power goes out, that's the condition, then the power will go off. That is the result. We've, we've learned if-then conditions from the time we were in, in grade school. It was one of, the, one of the primary things that we learned. The if-then statements. And so here we have this if-then statement. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, 
then the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We want to get to that result, but that means we have to first meet the conditions if we walk in the light. We think about that concept of in the light. As Corey noted last week, walking in the light parallels our uh, confession of sins. In fact, uh, there's several great parallels between verse 7 and verse 9, and we want to make note of three of them. One is, if we walk in the light, parallels if we confess our sins in verse 9. Now, it's, it's, it's imperative that we note that the, the tense, and I know we hate talking about grammar, but the tense of if we walk is a present tense which does not indicate a conclusion, meaning if we keep on walking in the light. By the way, that same condition is, is, is uh, present in verse 9. It's not just if we confess our sins once, but if we keep on confessing. And that's, that's important to note. It's not just that we walk in the light for a little time and then we reset and walk in the light for a little time and then reset and walk in the light for a little time, but that we start walking in the light and we continue walking in that light. It's an ongoing process. And in the same way, we're not just confessing after every little sin. That's not what John is talking about. He's saying that we begin a life of confession that continues onward. We keep on confessing. That's the parallel between the two, and I would say that verse 9 is explaining what verse 7 is. Living a life of continual confessing is living a life that is walking in the light. Yeah. Notice the next parallel. As he is in the light, talking about God and the fact that he is light and where he dwells is in lightness, <laughs> he is faithful and just. What's that saying about God? That God is light? that God is walking in the light, that God himself is shining in that same light because of his faithfulness and his justice. God is the same. And it's pictured again, paralleled. And then finally, uh, that, that, that last one, he cleanses us from all sin. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The parallel there is, is quite clear. And here again, uh, the tense is important because as long as the condition is being met, then the result is coming to us. As long as we are walking and as long as we are confessing, God is there cleansing. Walking refers to our personal daily conduct. I think a lot of times as Christians we're tempted to say, well, walking in the light means walking perfectly without sin. But that misses John's whole point because the very next verse tells us if we say we have no sin, then we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 8 comes after verse 7. Verse 7 is, if you're walking in the light, but if you're walking in the light and you say that you have no sin at all, then you're a liar. So walking in the light cannot possibly mean sinless perfection. It is not that I'm walking the light until I sin and then I step out of the light in that moment and I'm no longer walking the light until I, I repent and confess and ask for God's forgiveness and then all of a sudden I step back over in the light. Walking in the light is walking openly before God, readily admitting that I am a sinner and that I, I have failed to meet his challenge more often times than I would like to think. It is about being open and transparent with God. God, I am a sinner, and as much as I try, I know that I still fail. It is that attitude of, of penitence towards God. Even while we are walking in the light, we will sin. That's what John is saying. While you're walking in the light, you will still sin. Do I leave the light? No, that's not what John says. He says you're still in the light. Because God cleanses you. That's the blessing. That's why walking in the light still requires that confession in verse 9. It begins with the open confession to God that we are not perfect. We own up to our sin. We don't try to hide it. We don't deny it. We don't minimize it. We don't forget it. We don't legitimize it. We say, God, I, I fall short of everything that you've called me to do. For everyone who does wicked things, hates the light, and does not 
come into the light, lest his works should be exposed. You know why John said that in, in, in John 3 and verse 20? Because people who are not walking in the light, they don't want anyone to know about it. People who, people who engage in sin, they want to keep it secret. They, they, want, they don't want to be exposed. And so they don't want to come into the light. They don't want to walk in the light because they've got to admit, I'm a sinner and I'm not doing what I ought to do. They want to keep this part of their lives hidden and under wraps and make sure that no one knows about it. I don't want to let anyone to know that I'm a sinner. I don't want anyone to know what I struggle with. I don't want to know, I don't want people to know how I failed my God and how I failed my community. And so we, we hide those things away. We shield that from the world. And sometimes we think that we are shielding that from God. Because if anyone ever knew what I did in the dark recesses of my life, you would never respect me. You would never love me. And God would never save me. But walking in the light is coming to the community and to God and saying, I fall short. I don't measure up. Those that don't walk in the light, or those that refuse to walk in the light or they walk in darkness, they do not want their works exposed. Those who walk in the light are saying, God expose me. Expose me to my own sin. Expose me to my community. Expose me so that I may be washed and cleansed daily by your grace. But besides that, there's the blessing. If that's the condition, here are the blessings. It's twofold. The first one is that if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And it's interesting because when we see this, uh, uh, we might expect it to be the opposite of what he said in verse 6. Wherein he says, if we say we have fellowship with him, that is God, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. He says that, that we cannot be in fellowship with God if we are walking in darkness. And so we almost expect him to say in the contrast, but if we walk in the light instead of darkness... Then we have fellowship with God who cleanses us from all unrighteousness. But that's not what he says. John takes us a step further, adding to the blessing. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship not with God per se, but with one another. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have fellowship with God. What, what John is doing is adding the obvious. Yes, we have fellowship with God, but it goes even beyond that. We have fellowship with everyone else who has fellowship with God. That's what he says in the first paragraph of John, 1 John when he says that, that uh, we're writing these things that your joy may be full in verse 4. Uh, he says that, that we are doing this so that your fellowship can be with the Father and with the Son and truly our fellowship is with Him as well. There is a blessing in that joint fellowship that we have with God. So John takes it a step further in verse 7. He says, it's not just with God, it's with everyone who is in fellowship with God. Walking in the light brings fellowship with, uh, with the light, that is God, but it brings fellowship with all of those who are in fellowship with him, which means that it crosses the world and uh, throughout the ages, our bond of fellowship with Christians, that joint participation with carrying the salvation of God to the world, it crosses every boundary. It doesn't matter your, your gender. It doesn't matter what, what race or ethnicity you identify with. It doesn't matter the country of your origin. It doesn't matter the, the, the current country of your current status. It, it, none of those things matter. Christianity crosses all of those boundaries and we have fellowship. We share a common salvation in the blood of Christ. And we, we share a common goal in the saving of lost souls. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. He came to seek and save that which was lost. We have fellowship with that, that mission to seek and save the lost ourselves. We have a common love for lost souls. God so loved the world. And so our, our love is as common as God's. We have a common heart to help those who are in need do good unto all people, especially those of the household of faith. Galatians 6 and verse 10. We share in these common bonds of fellowship, and it makes us stronger. As we do these things together, we become fit to stand against 
the sin that would, would, would deceive us and corrupt us. But it does not make us perfectly sinless. While with other Christians I am stronger against sin, it doesn't make me sin less uh, uh, because I will still commit sin. And that brings us to the second blessing and why it is so striking to us. That is, the blood of Jesus Christ or Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. There is a continual cleansing by the blood. It is important to understand the impact of, of John's statement. If we keep on walking in the light, we keep on having fellowship with one another. And his blood keeps on cleansing us. Day after day after day after day. Obeying the gospel, being baptized for the remission of our sins, removes every sin up to that point. But it puts us in contact with his blood that will from that moment on continue to cleanse us as long as we meet the condition we are walking in the light. That means when we sin, as John assures us he will, the blood of Jesus will cleanse us. Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all run unrighteousness. God actively, continually cleanses us as we continually confess him we do not lose our fellowship with him simply because of one sin this is called sanctification that's the doctrine of sanctification it means washing the doctrine of washing the blood of Christ washes us Re Revelation 17 and verse 14, our robes are white washed in the blood of the Lamb. It would seem counterintuitive to wash white in blood, and yet that's exactly what happens. But if we stop walking or confessing, he stops cleansing. Now, I know there are objections to this. Some are going to say, yes, but you're teaching once saved, always saved. There is a vast difference between what John is saying here and once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved, saved means that once you are sinned, it is impossible for you to lose that salvation. There's nothing you can do to jeopardize it. I, I've mentioned it before. I was studying with a, a man in Celeste, Texas. He was a, a Baptist preacher. And, and me and another friend of mine were sitting there talking with him. And, and, and he was trying to explain how uh, there was perseverance in the saints. And he said, he said, I can walk out of my office right now. I can walk over to that convenience store. I can rob it, kill everyone in it, walk out in the street, get hit by a Mack truck, and go straight to glory. No. The idea of once saved, always saved means that you could never do anything to jeopardize that salvation. That's a far cry from what John is saying here. What John is saying is if we walk in the light, if we keep that condition, then the cleansing comes to us. When we stop meeting the condition, we stop receiving the blessing. John says in verse chapter 2 and verse 1, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. I'm trying to protect you from sin. I'm trying to get you to change your life and live in such a way that you don't sin. But if anyone sins, does sin, notice, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Notice one thing he doesn't say here. He doesn't say, but if anyone sins, remember, we have a way to come back to him. Putting the onus upon us or the burden upon us to make a move toward God. That's not what John does, is it? John says, I write these things to get you not to sin, but if, but if you do sin, what happens? God kicks in. Not, not you kick in. God kicks in. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus takes care of our sins as we live humbly before God. That humility, that attitude of confession, that attitude of repentance, those are essential. You take those away, and you take away the efficacy of the blood of Christ. And you do walk out of the light. And if you die that way, you will be lost forever, for an eternity. 
Some will say, yes, but you have to repent and confess. Of course, if you, if you know your sin uh, and, and, and you're living rightly, that you will have the immediate tinge of guilt and you will, you will confess in that moment, you will repent, you will, you will determine in your heart that broken heart that I'm not going to do those things. Or I, you might say that I, I, I've done this too many times. I, I've repented of this too many times. I find myself fighting this sin over and over. And there's going to be a struggle within your heart. Absolutely. Just like in Daniel. Corey brought that up the other day in our, our devotional. When Daniel began to pray and God sent the angel to answer and the angel said, I, I started my mission at your first word. You didn't even get to that, mention what you needed yet, Daniel. And we were already in the process of getting it done. Before we even pray that prayer, God is already washing our sins. Because we were overtaken in a sin doesn't mean that we stepped out of the light. But it does mean that the blood of Christ is going to cleanse us in that moment. As we become aware of our sins, we're going to confess it. But, you know, the Bible speaks of times of, of secret sins. Roman, or Psalm 90 and verse 8. Or, or what, what Job said in Job 34 and verse 32 uh, sins that are hard, it's hard to confess what we don't know. He said, teach me what I do not see. If I have done iniquity, I will do it no more. How do you immediately repent of a sin that you don't even see? We don't. But that doesn't mean until we pray a prayer for God to forgive us of all our secret sins that we're lost until that prayer or until that confession. Look at it this way. Walking in the light involves praying without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. In 1 John 1, 9, confession without ceasing. Even what Jesus says in Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5, to repent. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. That repentance there is not a one-time action. What he says there is... Keep on repenting. Keep on that path of repentance. And, and in Matthew 10, uh, uh, whoever confesses me keeps on confessing me before men. What Jesus says is walking in the light is continual praying, continual confessing, and continual repenting. That's, that's what we're saying we need to do in order to be washed in the blood, right? Right? So if I'm walking in the light, I'm praying without ceasing. It doesn't mean that I've prayed a prayer and then I stop that prayer and I come over here and I pray another prayer and I stop that one and I come over here later in the day and pray another prayer. But my life is a continual communication with God. Not just that I have the one-time act of a confession, but that my life is continually confessing of my failures and my faults. But casting my cares upon God. Prayer, confession, and repentance are more than a one-time act. Yeah, they involve those. But they make up the Christian way of life. And if we are striving to live that way, God knows. And he doesn't break off our relationship because I said a bad word in a moment of folly. I know this because when I slip up and sin overtakes me, there's an immediate sense of guilt in my heart because I'm living this way. Not because I'm perfect, but because when I fail, when I disappoint my Creator and Savior, I feel it. Look, if, you're not, if you don't feel that guilt, you need to start walking in the light. If you don't feel sin when it comes into your life, then you need to repent now and come to God. Some say, well, what do you have to do to be lost again then? Rationalize or ignore your sins. Pretend they don't exist. Continue in sin that grace may abound as they were in Romans 6. Try to save ourselves by thinking that we are living beyond the reach of sin. Sin doesn't have an effect on me. 
or thinking that because you said that prayer fast enough that you were good enough for God. You do those things and yeah, you, you walk out of the light. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there remains no sacrifice for sin. Hebrews 10.26. Now take, take account of what he's saying. If we sin willfully, deliberately, if we go on doing the things that we want to do, there remains no longer a sacrifice for sin. Look, the Hebrew writer is not coming in and saying, uh, if you were saved and then you, and then you start deliberately, willfully sinning, uh, you can never be saved again. What he's saying is, that sacrifice, which has its continual cleansing effect on you before walking in the light, that no longer is effective because you've stopped walking in the light. But that person that stops walking in the light, don't you know that they can, they can repent again? That they can come to God in humble obedience, casting themselves as a sinner before Him and upon His grace, and that He will be saved again because the sacrifice of sin is still effective for them. It's still an opportunity for them. They just walked away from it. And now they're coming back. Billy Joel. Yeah, the singer. One of his songs, Say Goodbye to Hollywood, has a line in there that says, Life is a series of hellos and goodbyes. And that's true. We see people come into our lives and leave our lives and things like that. But for the Christian, that should not describe the relationship with God. When I'm righteous, it's hello God. And when I sin, it's goodbye God. And then when I'm righteous again, it's hello God. But rather, God says, if you will come and walk humbly with me, I'll take care of everything else. And that gives us our assurance. If we strive to walk in the light, God is faithful to cleanse us. It's the greatest blessing we can ever know. But for some Christians, they've given up walking in the light. They've walked away. They've left the faith. And that may be your case. Maybe you have, you've left the church for a while and you're coming back and you're, you're, you're dipping your toe in the pool again, as it were, and you're kind of getting acclimated to the idea of the family of God again. But you have to know that when you walked away from the light, you walked away from that continual salvation. You walked away from the sacrifice. It was no longer remaining for you in those moments. And so I beg you this morning, turn back to him. Come back to the fellowship and the salvation that you left behind. God is where he always has been. To those who have never walked in God's salvation, to those who have never responded to the gospel, God loves you so much that he, he came to this world to suffer shame and ridicule and pain and death to the uttermost to take away or to take our place for punishment. And if you believe that and you're saying to yourself, I want... I want the power of that gospel. I want the power of that blood. You, are, you must repent of your sins and confess him before men and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And God will save you. And so the decision is right here before each one of us. Will I come into the fellowship this morning? Will I return to it right now, to the grace and the love that God has given to us? Will you come? to full assurance that God has saved you. Will you come this morning while we stand and while we sing?